so we know there's a focus on the mind, in Judaism in general. Why, when it comes to our tefillin, are we putting the arm on first? This should strike us as quite bizarre, especially a world that really does invest themselves in the studying of books. Why is the mind being given second place to the arm? This is where Rav Hirsch really does, in my opinion, give us such a key idea of appreciating Judaism in a way that perhaps hasn't been emphasized enough in recent history. So let's break it down. We've focused on the internal, the parshais, the parchments that are within the tefillin, and how that is supposed to make an internal impression by recognizing the internal components of the tefillin and how what's written on them should have an impression on us and how we should judge ourselves in reflection to these ideas. But what about the order in which we put on the tefillin themselves? Because this is the, in a way, the more dramatic side of tefillin. It's not just putting it on. We put on, we take off, we put on in different orders. Why? What idea is being impressed here? Because if there are other possibilities, Rav Hirsch wants to ascertain the meaning in the direction that we actually do it. So let's begin. What do you do? You put your arm on first, then your head. You then take off the head, and then take off the arm. For Rav Hirsch, this gives us a profound truth of Judaism. Let's break it down. Within the tefillin, we spoke about the parshais and the ideas that are contained within it, but when it comes to the head tefillin, they're all in separate compartments, four separate scrolls. These four ideas are on four separate parchments. In the arm, they're all within one parchment, in one box. So on your head, it's fragmented, as in all the ideas are in separate components. With your arm, it's all in one box. And to begin with, this is very reflective of what it means to be human. And before we break down the hashkafic or the philosophical aspects that are relatable to Judaism, there is a universal truth being impressed here. Your mind is fragmented. We know this from our own experience. Uh, today I could feel closer to God. Tomorrow I might be more distant. I might be confused. I might have doubt. I might be more committed. The mind isn't unidimensional. The mind is fragmented. That is the nature of what it means to be human, and this is being validated by the tefillin. The arm, on the other hand, the nature of action is unidimensional. It's, 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 it's in one direction. It, only one thing can happen. The mind, we have split. That is the nature of ideas. But when you act, there's only one thing you can do. And Rath Hirsch says this is the message of the tefillin. On this level, the mind has separate ideas based off the principles that are written on the parchments. They are four separate components, four separate concepts. God is love, God is judge, but they are to be lived out in one principle. But more than that, not only do you have the multiplicity of ideas that have to be lived out in one action, you first put on the arm to recognize that when it comes down to it, what happens in the mind has to be with the goal of the arm in mind. To say that again, when you study Tyra, it cannot be an abstraction, like a brain in a vat or on a ivory tower. It must be within the goal of acting in the world. It's not this um, purely cerebral experience. That, for Rav Hirsch, isn't Jewish. There is obviously a value of Talmud Torah for its own sake, but not for its own sake of, I'm just studying. You're not always able to act it out, but the goal should be to want to act it out in the world. When Rav Hirsch, in his Pirish on the uh, in his explanation on the Siddur, where he talks about last week, but very Sarah, where we say the bracha on Berchas uh, Satira, uh, Rav Hirsch talks about how there was a time in history where the Jewish people suffered for their lack of attention to Tyra. And the way he describes it, or the way Chazal put it, is that the people in those days put their Torah before them. They put it as an external component that needed to be studied. The studying of it was an intellectual experience, not a lived mission. When you study something, you can do that in two modes. You can do it in the mode of, I need to understand these ideas, or I need to understand these ideas to act them out in the world. Those are two different modes. The Jew does the latter, and that is illustrated by the tefillin, arm going first. The action is the goal. The action is the goal not only of general life, but it is the goal of the study as well. How will you live this out in the world? Not, ideally, I will study it and it will remain within my mind, no, the very studying has to have the goal of action. If you are just studying, then you're just studying ideas. If you're studying ideas, 
as the personality who wants to be able to live them out in the world, you are a different person. And this is the person that Judaism is trying to mold us into. Not academics, but people who study the Torah to act it out in the world. And that really does apply to so many components within Judaism. When we speak of fear of God, back when we spoke about the Torah as the philosophical principles of Judaism, we focused in on the fact that it wasn't just an idea that you have to have in the mind, but it has to be an idea in the mind, the goal being, how will this change how I act in the world? This is the message of the tefillin. I put on my arm first to recognize and dedicate that my actions are the goal. That is the point. The mind comes afterwards. The mind is essential, but it has to be through the lens of how will this be acted in the world? How will I be able to enact this in Hashem's world? These are different types of people. One is a academic ivory tower professor, which have their value, but from a religious standpoint. The other is a striving to learn to do. And it's it's so interesting. When we take it off, you first take the head off because you don't want to be in a position where you just have the mind in isolation because that has, to quote Rav Hirsch, little value. There is value. If a person, and these are two separate mitzvahs, if a person can only do one or the other, then you do your best. But the ideal that we are striving for is the unification of the two. And just to put it onto the ethical plane, from a Jewish standpoint, you have, let's say, you ask a, a Jewish ethicist, what would you prefer? A person to do have beautiful thoughts about the poor, beautiful thoughts about humanity, beautiful thoughts about the world, but never do anything? Or would you prefer the person who has, ah, doesn't like poor people, but always gives poor people money? Do you want the person who thinks lovely about the poor, but never gives the poor? Or the person who thinks harshly about the poor, but always makes sure he gives poor people money? Obviously the latter. Just simply, that, that is more Jewish. We prefer the person who acts in the world, and this has a dynamic relationship because the type of person who studies with the intention of acting, even if he doesn't get the opportunity, his study has the quality of study that the Torah is looking for. That is the Torah's description of Talmud Torah, Lishma. What is Lishma from the viewpoint of Rav Hirsch? Lishma is that I'm not studying it to have it in my mind. I am studying it to understand it with the goal to fulfill the will of God. Now, that fulfilled the will of God, if we put into other language, I am studying Torah to understand it and fulfill my mission, to fulfill my duty. Now, depending on your situation, certain things you can do and certain things you can't do, depending on the tools we were given. But if we study with the intention of accomplishing our mission, that is lishma. I become a ambassador. I become a representative of God in the world. And that is the point of Judaism from the point of view of Talmud. That is the point of Talmud Torah. Talmud Torah is for me to be the best ambassador, to be the best one who can live out my duty. Lishma, for its own sake, what does it mean for its own sake? For the sake of the duty, for the sake of the mission, for the sake of this noble meaning that I am being called on. That is why I study Torah. I study Torah through that lens. And then that's because, then that is what we call Lishma. So to recap these points, we put on the arm to fill in first, then the head. Side point, the reflection of reality of how we experience life. The f mind is fragmented. The arm is not. You only do one thing. You cannot choose multiple things to do. You can only do one thing. And that is validated by the tefillin. The ideas are fragmented. As they are fragmented in the very structure of the tefillin, they are in separate compartments. These parashas, these separate ideas, come together to one action. Separate in concept, but unified in action. And when you take it off, you first take off the head. Because just the head being left on its own has little value. Action on its own, we can see the value from a Jewish standpoint in a profound way, because the focus of Judaism is in this world. And to really wrap it up, there's a reason why we call the tefillin a bias, batim, houses because that is also a condensed idea of the goal. You are building a house in this world. It is a focus on this world where Judaism lives itself out. So we have four separate parchments, or one parchment with everything written on it. We have a tefillin shal rosh and a tefillin shal yad, and they are all in a house. 
these ideas that are to be cultivated within your house. Rav Hirsch focuses in on that Judaism, once again, whenever it has an opportunity for us to focus on key ideas, they are focused within this world. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful week.